Our next question is, if eligible to file Chapter 7, why would I use Chapter 13? This is an excellent question. Uh, let's say that you have a prior marriage, and in the divorce decree, you were required to pay your former spouse, not alimony, but uh, the judge, the divorce judge decided that you owed her for division of property. Uh, maybe you owned a business and the judge said, well, over a period of time you will repay her X amount of dollars for that business. And let's assume the business uh, failed, but the divorce decree says that you still owe your former spouse the property settlement amounts. Well, that kind of a debt, a marital property settlement, that is not dischargeable in a Chapter 7. However, uh, it is dischargeable in a Chapter 13. Once you complete your plan payments over a three or five year period, depending on the requirements, then your marital property settlement debt would be canceled. Uh, the next one, of course, is fairly obvious for most of us. If you have delinquent home or auto payments and you want to keep the home or the auto, then Chapter 7 won't work for you. You need them to file under Chapter 13. Uh, let's say you uh, borrowed money and uh, your parents or someone else uh, signed as a guarantor for you. If you file a Chapter 7, then that lender will probably uh, demand collection from whomever guaranteed your loan. However, if you file Chapter 13, and you repay that loan during the term of the Chapter 13 plan, then during the uh, period of the Chapter 13, they can't sue the guarantor. Now that rule only applies for consumer loans. So if you were in business and somebody guaranteed that loan, Chapter 13 won't help you there. But if, if they co-signed for a consumer loan, then Chapter 13 not only protects you, but it also protects your guarantor. Now, upcoming medical bills. This comes up more and more frequently. Let's say that uh, your wages are being garnished or a uh, home is about to be foreclosed on and we have to file bankruptcy. We've just got to file bankruptcy. However, uh, next month you have or someone in your family has major surgery scheduled and you don't have health insurance. Well, if we file a Chapter 7, the only debts that are discharged are the debts that exist on the day you file your Chapter 13. So your future medical bills that you know you're going to have would not be uh, discharged if we file a Chapter 7. So sometimes what we may do is we'll say, well, let's go ahead and file a Chapter 13, and we'll make some minimal payments through a Chapter 13 plan. We'll wait a couple of months until those bills come in, and then we'll convert the Chapter 13 to a Chapter 7. Sometimes that makes all the difference in the world to a family. So it's a, it's a good technique to do uh, if, if we have to. Uh, what types of debts are not discharged? You know, the list uh, goes on for quite a ways. Court fines, uh, speeding tickets, uh, income taxes. You need to let me look at your income taxes. There are three basic rules on uh, taxes. There's a three-year rule, two-year rule. Uh, when you come in, I need to look at your income taxes, if you owe income tax, and, and uh, I can let you know uh, if they're dischargeable. The general, you know, you'll hear a lot of attorneys say that income taxes are not dischargeable. Well, that isn't true. A lot of income taxes are dischargeable. So when you come in, let me take a look at that. Child support, of course, is not uh, dischargeable. Marital maintenance, what we used to call alimony, that is not dischargeable. Criminal restitution. Uh, you have a criminal case and you were ordered to do something by the criminal judge. That is not discharged. Now, personal injury, drunk driving. Uh, we have an interesting case that I think, as I recall, it just came out here a few weeks ago. It's from St. Louis. Uh, a young lady became intoxicated one evening and she ran into four or five cars. Uh, and they were alleging that, well, that's not dischargeable because she was drunk and driving. Well, 
it was dischargeable. The, the bankruptcy judge said, yes, it is dischargeable because she didn't do any personal injury. There wasn't anybody in the car, cars, when she ran into them. It was property damage to cars. Therefore, it was dischargeable. Uh, the last one's pretty obvious, false uh, financial statements. Uh, if you give a false financial statement, then uh, that's the equivalent of, of uh, defrauding uh, a lender. I have a pending claim for workman's comp. Will I get to keep any recovery I might receive? If you'll re review our exemption section uh, when we cover exemptions, I uh, give mention in there, yes, workman's compensation claims that are pending are uh, are fully protected. However, if you are receiving workman's comp benefits, they are only protected up to the point where you uh, need those funds to uh, provide for your support. You know, a lot of times you'll settle a workman's comp case and uh, as part of the settlement you'll be paid an annuity over a period of years. Uh, that annuity must be shown as necessary for your care and expense before it will be uh, protected. I have a pending auto accident claim. Do I get to keep any part of the recovery? The answer is uh, no with a qualification. There is no exemption uh, protecting a personal injury claim. However, from a practical standpoint, let's say you have a personal injury claim and uh, you file bankruptcy. Well, you don't have any obligation to complete that lawsuit. If you're not going to get anything out of it, you can't be expected to work for nothing. So usually the trustees will say, well, if you cooperate with me in, in pursuing the case, then I will give you 50% of the recovery. I think that's a, a normal workout. But you need to work with your bankruptcy attorney and your uh, personal injury attorney together so that you, you come out with the best benefit. Ideally, the best thing to do is settle the personal injury claim before you ever file bankruptcy.